my awesome crew of individuals. We have Eric Osborne here in the hey, front. We have Taylor Hudgens right here. Yeah. And uh, before I introduce the the last member of the uh, of the Think Real Estate team, I just want to kind of give this person a tribute. Um, the reason that this exists is because this individual two years ago uh, moved into the area, and she had a, a vision of how she wanted to conduct real estate in this in this area. She designed um, the lifestyle that she wanted to live and then went after setting a path to achieve that goal. Um, it should resonate with individuals in this room as you go out to build your real estate business, right? There's gonna be times where you just put yourself out there and it doesn't reap the reward until six months down the line, down the line 12 months down the line, two years down the line. She's affected multiple individuals in this room. She's helped them achieve their goals and so, uh, She's getting ready to move to Arizona to continue down that path in uh, lifestyle design and, and uh, wealth creation. She's basically built a family, a network of individuals that have allowed not only the people in this room to, to benefit, but folks that are not attached to uh, this particular business, such as our CPAs, our lawyers, so on and so forth. Um, so, Melanie McDaniels. Like I didn't, I, I pulled chalks. I completely like burned the boats, burned the ships. Didn't tell my dad because he told me I was stupid for quitting my job. I had a nice, cushy federal career, um, the National Park Service, and but it wasn't fulfilling me. So anyway, now I'm doing it again, except this time I have a little bit of a, you know, savings and a little buffer. I'm going to do the next thing in real estate investing. I'm going to be a capital raiser for larger syndications. Um, my plan is to by fall next year to be completely location independent, living, working from a computer all over the world. So right. design your lifestyle, be intentional about the choices you make. Well, so you're leaving, but you're gonna be focusing on your online presence. So yes. where can people find you, to follow you, and still be connected with you? For now, find me in the Think Team stuff. Um, my platform will probably launch in about February. I'm gonna go to Thailand for a month to be among the digital nomads of the world and get some help with uh, the launch. So it's gonna be Freedom, oh sorry, Free Style Capital Group, Financial Freedom, Lifestyle Design. Um, so that will be that. I have to figure out how to do it without getting arrested. <laughs> NBC. <laughs> so yeah, I, I need help. I have a coach. I have people that will help me, and that's what you guys need. You need mentors. You need coaches. Don't be afraid to invest money in some of those things. They take you to the next level so much faster. Woo! So for now, just do the thing stuff, um, and I'll be in touch with that until I have something launched. Where are you going in Arizona? Uh, Phoenix area, Scottsdale, wherever. I don't awesome. know. Awesome. Great My sister's there. My grandfather's there. But you know, there's this thing, so I'll do some real estate there, there's this thing called staged houses. So there's these multi-million dollar homes there that people yeah. are trying to sell as their second home. They're not around, so they need someone to live in the home. So when there's a showing, you have to go turn the lights on. So maybe I'll have to jump. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't <know. laughs> I don't really need a home because I'm gonna be going abroad. So I don't know, we'll cool. see. Awesome. Thank you. Congratulations. Yeah. Congratulations. Nobody has a regular Christmas sweater on. I forgot. <laughs> We have to figure out someone to give that. Audio wins. <laughs> <laughs> no, we gotta, we'll figure it out, something with yeah. the CPA, yeah. but we have a gift to give. Maybe Ted can uh, throw some questions out there and whoever answers the correct question wins the gift. So, um, yeah, so Melanie is a great example of what you can accomplish in this business, right? Um, she is an investor, she, she's put together this group, and now it's gonna continue uh, in her absence. So, um, <laughs> sticking back to the Think Real Estate team, there's a couple of places that you can find us. Facebook, meetup.com, the Think RE team, uh, dot com, uh, YouTube, Instagram, follow, like, share, do all those things, tweet, 
so that you're in the know, right? If you haven't, uh, if you haven't filled in your, um, filled out the questionnaire, the questionnaire, the sign-in sheet, go ahead and do that. We also um, send out an email reminder, two, two emails, the announcement for the next month, and then a uh, reminder heading into that day, that week, so that uh, you can come get this education. If you don't follow, share, and like everything Think Real Estate, we're gonna start charging the individuals that are not following us. Okay. Um, I skipped the housekeeping. For anybody that needs to use the restroom, go out the store, stick to the, uh, to the hall on the right, and where you see the printer, turn in there, the restrooms are in there. Cool? Um, our guest speaker tonight is Ted Kona from Zuckerman & Associates. He's going to be doing the CPA talk, which is incidentally also a TED talk, right? <laughs> <laughs> so without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to TED, and Ted's going to introduce his team. All right. The format, everybody should have gotten three handouts. Uh, our kind of planner, uh, W9, and questions for the end. Actually, those are the questions that we received from you all. So um, we're just going to go in that order. Um, I've lived in Virginia my whole life. I've been practicing 30, over 37 years. Um, and our company is about 40 uh, professionals. Uh, and these are two of them. So I'm gonna let them tell them who they are and they've been with us a while. And um, so that way, every on your planners, you're gonna see two cards and that's them, okay? So, um, Got questions after the fact? Feel free to call them or me, but I can give you my phone number. So, um, so they're better to go. They're um, cheaper rates than me. How about that? So, um, go ahead, David. Say something about yourself. Hi, I'm David Yates. Uh, I've been working with Zuckerman for 15 years now, and I'm from local down here, Virginia Beach. One of the few actual true locals that grew up down here too. So, uh, kind of short and sweet. Okay. Kyle Coleman, a uh, local as well, uh, born and raised, went to James Madison, uh, stayed in practice for six years. Uh, like he said, I'm more available than him, and I'm even cheaper than him. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, I'm going to jump right into the W9 um, and, and talk about it. I don't know how many of you all in this room know about W9s. Uh, I did four, four seminars like this last year, and I let off all four of them with the W-9, and I got so many blank looks, so many questions about it, not only during the night, but the next several weeks afterwards. And this is something that, you know, I'm gonna pretend like I'm an IRS agent because IR agents are the ones that you've gotta worry about these. So what this is, is a request for information. And so before, if whether you're a flipper, whether you're a renter, whether you, um, are in the real estate business collecting a commission and, and, and paying anybody. If you pay anybody and you want a business deduction, um, you're going to be able to take it. This is you're supposed to report the amount to IRS that you have paid a contractor, a subcontractor, or anybody uh, that is um, that really for any any type of expense that you're going to, to take on your tax return. So I'm gonna start at the top, it's gonna to ask for the, the contractor's name, and you see in box three, that's, that's the key right here. When you pay a corporation, whether it's an S or C corp, it doesn't matter how much you pay them, there is no reporting requirement unless you pay an attorney more than 600 bucks. So that's kind of what this is trying to drive at. Are you a non-corporation uh, that you are paying? Because if they are a non-corporation, then if you pay them $600 or more, you have a filing requirement with IRS. And it used to be 25 years ago, if you, when I had an audit and they said, all right, where's the 1099 for that contractor for your client? It was a $50 penalty. And that was it. It didn't matter if you were five years late. It was a $50 penalty. And I could tell you, as many as I had, they always said, oh, go, go ahead and file it now. We'll waive the penalty. And then about 15 years ago, they raised it to 100 bucks per 1099. 
And I had a couple where the agent said, uh, you know, there's three or four of them. I, I always like to use, I had a uh, construction company and they paid all their subs. They gave them all 1099s uh, that should have, but they paid a deep sea guy uh, to go fishing off coast for entertainment. They paid somebody to fix the company van, uh, $600 repair, and there was another one. So there was all sorts of issues on the return, on the audit, but the agent said, well, I'm, I'm gonna hit you for $300 penalty uh, for the three 1099s you did not file. And I said, okay, fine, we'll file them. Uh, you'll waive the penalty, right? And she goes, no, we're, we're, we're not gonna waive these anymore. And I said, is that across the board? And she says, yes. So since then, those penalties have increased. We're up to now, uh, for 2000, for, for this next filing season, you're supposed to file these by January 31st, uh, the 1099 uh, related to who, who you make these payments to. And they're due January 31st, and if you're 30 days late, it's a $50 penalty. If it's, uh, if you file it before August 1st, it's a $100 penalty. If you file it after August 1st, it's a $270 penalty per 1099. And if you just say, you know what, I'm not gonna do it, I'm intentionally disregarding the law, it's a $550 penalty each 1099 you don't file. So that should get everybody's attention because again, it's anybody you pay more than $600 that you're taking a business deduction for. So if you uh, theoretically uh, you know, get an HVAC guy come out and you know, his labor charge is 400, but he charges you $4,000 for the HVAC, well, you're paying him $4,400, you're over 600 bucks. You're gonna give him a 1099 if he is an individual. And this form here is going to tell you whether he's an individual or not, or, or better yet, he's not a corporation. So remember, a corporation, if he fills this out and he checks a block that he's a S corp or a C corp, you're off the hook. Whether he is or he isn't, you're off the hook. So if you ever get audited, and they look and say, well, you know, John's heating service, uh, where's the W-9, you just pull this out of your records, say, hey, John Heating Service said he was a corporation, so that's why I did not file a 1099 on him. But if John's Heating Service is a partnership, a uh, single member LLC, uh, oh, let me come back to yeah, single member LLC, or a part, um, well, any of these others, uh, trust, estate, then you have this requirement. Now, there's more and more LLCs out there. So if you look in the middle of three, uh, they have LLC. So LLCs can be taxed as an individual. They can be taxed as a C corp. They can be taxed as an S corp. So if, if you are writing a check to an LLC, then you want to make sure they fill out that section to tell you whether they are, for tax purposes, a C corp or an S corp. Because if they're, again, if they're a C corp or an S corp, you're off the hook. You just need to keep this in your files if you ever get audited. And so, um, I, I put a couple arrows over there on what page, second to last page, um, kind of telling you, um, I mean, there, if you read all the instructions, you'll, you know, put yourself to sleep. But, but basically, what I am focusing on is really the people in this room who are taking business deductions and paying somebody more than 600 that is not a corporation, and I'm telling you, you have a filing requirement. On your returns, whether it is a Schedule E, whether it is a Schedule C for flipping, whether you're a corp or S corps, they ask you on every form now, did you pay anybody more than $600, okay? And you're supposed to truthfully ask, any individual $600 or more, and if you ask, say yes, the next question is, did you file a 1099 on behalf of that individual? And I pretty much bet you if you say no, you're just asking for trouble because, uh, I mean, you're admitting that I, I didn't do what I was supposed to do. So, I always say, you know, I got contractors that say, hey, my best person, you know, he's off the grid, he owes child support, he's, you know, I, I, you know, I can't give him a 1099. Uh, and I'm paying him too much. Uh, you know, he, he, he wouldn't work for me anymore. And I tell, that's a business decision whether you want to do that or not. I'm telling you, if IRS catches you, it's 550 bucks. 
each one of those people that you don't pay. So if you're willing to take the $550 penalty, then don't file them. But you still need to answer the questions correctly. Yes? Virtual assistant? If you pay them. Well, yeah, of course. If you're paying them, it, it's who's writing the checks. The, the other question I get is if somebody, if, if it's coming out of closing, you know, if you're doing repairs out of closing or anything, if the, I always say, the, if the uh, settlement agent is paying those, I, I'm saying you're off the hook because you're not writing that check. Uh, it's the checks that you write and you're going to deduct. We have a, I, I'm not going to get into what they call qualified business income. Uh, into the details because I can, I mean, we, the three of us, it will take us hours and hours to go through the details of it. But it's a new deduction that uh, started last year for 2018 returns. And in that, what, when I was here last year, we didn't know if single family rental properties would qualify for the QBI deduction. We didn't, there was a lot of uncertainty. And what they did is they, they made a lot of this certain. But what you're doing with like a single family rental is saying that it is a trade or business for tax purposes. And by doing that, any profit, 20% of it, won't, you won't pay taxes on. But when you go and say I'm a, you know, a qualified trade or business, you better do a 1099 because you're going down that path of saying that I am a trade or business. I would argue if I'm IRS and you don't fill out that trader or the 1099s, you're, you're kind of saying you're not a trader business and you may not get that 20% deduction because it's, IRS hasn't said, oh yes, yeah, single family rentals qualify. They've only given us weak guidance and, 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 and we take the position it is a qualified trader business. So when you're saying that, you got to do the 1099s to even, I, I say it's just extra insurance in your back pocket that we're saying we're a qualified trader business. Yes, we get this 20% deduction on the profits. Yeah, we're filling out the 1099s. We're doing everything we should do. And hopefully, you know, IRS agrees with that. So I'm not going to talk about any more. Uh, like I said, the W-9 is what you're supposed to give out to anybody before you, do, before you engage them. Because a lot of people won't do the work if you give them this 1099. They're, they're going to say, oh, no, I, you know, I'm, I'm off the grid. I'm telling you, if you don't get it up front, you won't get it on, on the back side. When I was, those four seminars I did last year, that was the main question. Hey, I already paid the guy. Uh, now he won't give me the W-9 back. Or, yeah, the W-9 back. And I said, I, 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 you know, I, you can't force him to give your, his Social Security number to you. But... Going forward, you need to make the business decision. Um, if he refuses to fill out the W-9, will I still employ him? So it's, it's a judgment call on your all's behalf. So we good with that? Any questions? Yes. Just be clear, so the limit to your exposure is 550 per contractor? Per 1099, you're supposed to file, yes. And then would they still go after them? If yes, they'll, they'll still go after them. That's exactly right. That's why they always wanted us to file them anyway, because then they, they, they go after the, the contractors to see it, what there was reported on their returns. But you've got to have the information in order to, you know, because they're asking for Social Security number if it's just an individual. Yes? How do you report it as an expense if the, piggyback off our question, like we pay our VAs in the thousands that aren't American citizens. So I pay them via PayPal or Venmo, and they do all my work. So as not American citizen, as not a social, how do I pay that expense if they're not? I mean, you're supposed to, I mean, the details of foreigners and, uh, you know, I mean, there's all sorts of examples in here of, how, you know, what you're supposed to do. Uh, make the effort, give them the W-9 up front, yeah, you're right, have them sign it, tell them what they are. I mean, I, I get that question with Canadians all the time because they don't have social security numbers, and you know. And I say, you know, just do what you can. I mean, you can't issue it if they don't have it. So, if they don't, like, if, for example, if, if they refuse, which obviously we're not going to, like, our business is operated by the VA. So, if, if they refuse, can we still write that off? I would, yeah. I, I, absolutely. Okay. I mean, I, the question last year was, hey, I, I paid somebody four hundred bucks. Um, you know, is it worth taking the deduction? Yeah, I mean, whether you file it or not, I would still take the deduction. 
now you're just risking if you ever get audited, you know, will, will that come back and bite you? Because they have you, a record of that, I still have that. That's correct. I would still, even in that case, ask them to fill it out, tell them their circumstances, have them sign it, say that they don't have it because they're, you know, foreign national or, you know, whatever. Just something in your file. Because Iris is going to ask you, hey, why didn't you give them one? And this is why I didn't do it. And that's the accumulation of the total first of the year. Correct. It's yeah. from January 1st through December 31st. So if you pay somebody $400, in January and December, you pay another three hundred. You they have a filing requirement. Gotcha. And the same thing with if you're going to come to like your property management company and just wanted to equal more than six hundred dollars. That's correct. Okay. Yeah, the property management company is a corporation, S corp, C corp. Yeah, Actually, no, yeah, no, no, no. Any other questions? All right, I'm gonna move. Yeah. We ask our clients, well, we have to ask our clients when we're doing a return because it asks those two questions. And especially if we get the QuickBooks file or any other file, you know, if we see somebody in there, relative whoever you're trying to take a deduction for and it's over 600, you know, do you want to deduct this? Do you want to file a 1099? What, what do you want to do? And uh, now I will say, and I said it here last year, they ask, you know, did you pay anybody, any individual over 600 bucks? And you say, yes. And then the next question is, did you file 1099s? And you know, if you're supposed to give five different people 1099s, and it doesn't say, did you give all five 1099s? I always say, you know, yes, I gave out a 1099, whether it's one, two, three, four, or five. So again, you're running the audit risk uh, of not filing them but you also want to be truthful on answering the questions. Does that make sense? At least one. At least one. I, I force people to do one. When I see them in there, I said, look, I, I don't, if you don't want to report them, that's up to you. But file one so I can ask, ask, answer this question the way I want to ask, answer it. Yes, we did file 1099. All right. All right, I'm going to move on to, what, uh, I guess, choice of entity. Is that what? Yeah. All right. Um, when people come in, in our office, that's the number one question. What should I be doing? How should I be doing it? What should I set up? Um, all right. So I'll give you the basics real quick. If you're a flipper, okay, and you're flipping more than one or two a year, you're in a trader business. And as a trader business, uh, you definitely want to be an LLC. Okay. The only question is, do you want to make the S Corp election? All right, to, to be set up as an LLC or a corporation and get to uh, be taxed as an S Corp. I'll come back to that. If, you are in, if you're a renter or a renter, uh, landlord, and you're doing single family homes, you're doing commercial, you're doing any type of renting, you definitely want to be an LLC if you can. Uh, as an LLC, if you're husband and wife, I always encourage one of you to be that LLC, not both. By one member LLC is taxed just like not being an LLC. It goes onto your personal return, it goes on Schedule E, it's that simple. When you have two members, husband and wife, as LLC members, you have a tax return. You have a partnership return that you have to file. They ask, ask them, they ask so many questions on that partnership return, you have to give a balance sheet, you have to give the ending cash, the ending loans, everything. It's just a lot more work for us to do it. So because it's more work for us, we gotta charge more for it. So I got a lot of couples that say, I, I tell them, it's all marital property. So you know, the first one, I don't know, put in the wife's name. Second one, put in the husband's name. The next one, just keep setting up firewalls for single member LLCs. Uh, now, if you have a, because all of it's going to roll back onto your joint return anyway, so it doesn't matter. But when you have non-spouse partners, then you have a partnership, and you're, you're stuck with that. Now you have a partnership return, and, and, and you got to go down that path. Um, let's go back to the S-Corp. 
It's the same logic with S-Corps. You have a separate corporate return if you go down that path. Plus, you're supposed to pay the owners a reasonable salary. So you now have payroll returns you've got to do. You have you know, quarterlies. If you're, uh, you got, you got to remit uh, you know, payroll taxes, SUDA, SUDA, it's a lot more work. You got you know, end of the year payroll, you're gonna W-2, annual filing, plus you have a corporate return, okay? And the accounting fees, they start getting expensive. So, you're not gonna read this anywhere. I, I, I kinda just did this without tenure. I said, look, if you're flipping or any other business where it's a trader business, and you're making more than $50,000 a year, you wanna do S Corp. Because you will save more on the employment taxes than you will in the accounting fees. And the more you make, the better the S Corp looks. So I don't know how familiar anybody in this room is with S Corps, uh, but I'll give you a, a, a simple example. S Corps versus LLCs versus nothing you're gonna pay the same federal and state taxes. Okay, your income taxes won't change depending on those entities. So if people say, I, I wanna be an LSE, I'm gonna save taxes. Uh, no, it's, you're still gonna pay the same federal and state tax. <coughs> what you will save with an S Corp that you don't save with anything else is the payroll taxes. The self-employment tax, or you know, if, you, if you're getting a W-2, it's the, the FICA withholdings the Medicare withholdings, and I'll give you examples. So right now, if you're getting a W-2 from anybody, out of your check comes 6.2% for Social Security tax. Also, 1.45% for Medicare tax. Your employer matches those numbers. Okay, your employer kicks in 6.4, and they also kick in 1.45. So the federal government gets 15.3% of payroll taxes on every dollar you earn, okay? So if you're self-employed and not working for somebody, let's just say you make $100,000. Well, you're gonna pay federal and state taxes on that $100,000, but you're also gonna pay $15,300 of self-employment tax, which is huge. I mean, that's, it's, that's why a lot of small businesses don't make it because of the self-employment tax. So what the S Corp allows you to do is to, how should I say, limit, uh, reduce those self-employment tax. So if you have $100,000, you have to pay yourself what they call a reasonable salary. Let's just say that reasonable salary is $60,000. Okay, I say the, the amount of the, there is nothing written saying what that reasonable salary should be. But let's just say it's $60,000. I say that reasonable salary depends on how much you make. So if you have $60,000 and you're getting a W-2 from your own S Corp, out of that check, you're still, like I said, you're, they're gonna withhold out of that check the 6.2, the 145, and your own company's gonna match at 6.2, 145. So federal government's getting that 15.3% out of your $60,000 W-2. So again, you know, say it's 120, you have 20 expenses, you're net in 100, and you got a $60,000 salary, so you're gonna get a W-2 at the end of the year for that, and your S Corp now has a profit of $40,000. You'll get a K-1 from your corporation to report that 40,000. So on your personal return, you'll get the W-2 of 60, you'll get the K-1 for 40, so again, you're still reporting the 100 grand. But the S Corp profit is not subject to self-employment tax, and that's where you save the money. So you think about it, $40,000 times 15.3%, $6,000 savings, okay? Every single year you do that. When your profit is less than $50,000, I say it's hard to justify an S Corp, because let's just say your profit's only $40,000. What's a reasonable salary on $40,000? You know, I mean, say 20, okay? So you got 20, so your profit's 20, 
20,000 times 15.3 is about $3,000 of savings. And you say, well, that sounds good. But I'm telling you, the accounting fees to do all four quarters, the annual payroll, to do a projection, to make sure you're, you're doing reasonable salary, to do the corporate return, is probably $2,000, $2,500. Although you get a deduction for that, uh, you know, yeah, I'm gonna save 3,000, but I'm gonna spend 2,200 in accounting, plus I got all this corporate, I got payroll, I got, my life got very complicated for small savings. But the more you make, it's kind of my rule, if you're making more than 50, I, you, you save more and more and more. So um, that's kind of why I say 50, if it's less than 50, it's probably not worth the effort. But if you're continually gonna make more than 50, I'm all in on S-Corps. I love S-Corps. There, it's, it's, I got doctors, I, and I'm not exactly, I got doctors making $3 million, okay? I pay a million dollars salary, and they got $2 million in S-Corp draws. Two million, not subject to, because once you get over the 139,000, you've already paid in the max on the Social Security, you're only paying in the Medicare, but the Medicare is 145, the match is still 145, and because of the Obama surtax, it's another point zero zero nine. So it's really a 3.8% savings once you go over the Social Security limit. So you get $2 million times 3.8, what is that, $76,000. I got doctors doing it all day long, saving each of them $76,000 a year by being an S Corp versus an LLC or a C Corp. Uh, home run, I mean, that's, it's, it's a home run. Um, it's just, it's just a little bit more work. So you don't wanna be naked without being an LLC. The problem, well, the biggest problem becoming an LLC is usually you're carrying some debt on this property. And you can't very well, if you've already done it and you got it in your name and now you wanna transfer to an LLC, uh, usually the banks have a due on sale clause because you're transferring ownership. And that's a problem. And so my advice is, I mean, you really can't do it unless the bank can call the loan at any time. So you always want to do it up front. You always want to become the LLC. You want the bank on board with it. You want the loan to be in the LLC name. And that way you don't have this problem. Uh, <coughs> there are banks that won't do it. You can't do a VA loan and, and you know, with the, in an LLC. Uh, there's a lot of banks in Carolina on, on the Outer Banks that will not do it. I've had many clients walk away from buying properties down there because they said the banks won't do it because they got burned so bad about 12 years ago with LLCs. But to me, if I'm a bank, it doesn't matter whether it's in an, L, in an LLC, whether that loan is in the LLC and I'm personally guaranteeing it, or it's not in an LLC and I'm guaranteeing it. What, what difference does it make? Uh, but they like to charge a little bit more interest if they can, so it's, it's a reason for them to maybe up the rate a little bit if it's in an LLC. So again, if, if you're buying a property and you have a good banker, it's gonna be in the LLC. I, I, I can give you so many examples where people own 60, 80, 100 rental properties, and they're all in LLCs. They, they set it up right and did it right, and they got a good banker moving them along, and that banker uh, is working with them. And again, they're personally guaranteeing it. It's not like you're off the hook. It's not like it's non-recourse. They can't, can't come after you, but uh, they're insulated from liability. Just briefly, you want, if in the perfect world, you have 10, or 10 rental properties, you really want 10 LLCs if there's any equity in all of them. The reason being is if you had them all in one <coughs> LLC, and let's just say they're mortgaged to the hilt, and you know the whole goal here is for having somebody else pay down your mortgage. So over the years, the mortgages go down, the property increases in value, you've got some equity in there, and you know in year 15, Somebody falls over a balcony, somebody falls down the steps, kids eat paint off the wall, whatever the reason, they know you got equity in there, better yet, the attorney knows you got equity in there, they're gonna sue you. And now, instead of getting the equity out of just one rental property, they, they're gonna get the equity out of 10 properties. So, 
again, if you're mortgaged up 90% and year one you get sued, it's, I would say it prevents lawsuits when you have those because the attorney's gonna take the case and he's gonna say, hey, it's, it's an LLC, the property's worth 100, there's $80,000 of mortgage on it. The most I can get is what, maybe 20? Maybe, I, I'm not taking a case. It's not worth his effort. You have 10 of those, now I, instead of 20, he's got 200,000 in equity, you're gonna get sued. And, and it's just, the more you have, the more likely you're gonna get sued. I, I, I see it, they can attest to it. Um, I mean, I, I, I can spend hours just giving you examples. Big money, you know, getting sued for $20 million, $15 million, and the, and the attorneys know who those people are and they're, they're gonna go, they're, you know, it's, it's the game. So, single member LLCs, um, even with married couples, um, uh, saves you accounting fees. Uh, non, -fam non non spouses, you can, uh, uh, you got to be a partnership. Uh, trader businesses, flipping, real estate agents. People ask me, can I put both in the same? Absolutely. What risk do you have? You don't have any assets in these things. You have a flip for a little while, but you know, being a, a real estate agent and having flips in the same LLC, in the same LLC slash maybe if you're, you're if you're doing well as a real estate agent, more than fifty thousand of income. Yeah, put them both in that S corp. Now, now, now you're going to start saving some money, especially if you have good reoccurring commissions. Um, what did I talk about? I know, we're, we're gonna get to oh, that. We're not there yeah. yet? Oh, okay, good. Yeah, I'll have to watch <laughs> um, Any other choice of entity? Yes. Just question on the 50,000, you have to the net income? Yes. For the 50,000, or gross income? Uh, net, net income, after expenses. Okay. Because, you know, what's a reasonable salary on 50? Yeah, maybe 30. So you got 20 left, 20 times 15.3, it's like 3,000 of savings, um, but, but with more hassle is, is my point. Um, any other questions about choice of entity? Yes. Other than ex risk exposure, is there any sa savings from a tax perspective by uh, not having your flipping income in the same um, LLC as your rental income? Well, well, flipping income, okay, is really a trader business if, if you hold yourself out to be a flipper. And that is subject to self-employment tax, whereas rental income is not. And that's why, you, you know, I say if you're renting, you never ever want to put real estate in a corporation, whether it's a C corp, is it even worse, or even an S corp. Even if you put that in an S corp, it could possibly hurt you. It may not hurt you, but it possibly could. We've had examples, just, just screwy situations where our clients missed an opportunity because they had real estate in an S Corp. A, a good example was, uh, they didn't work on it. Guy had 10 apartments, okay? And about a year and a half ago, somebody from New York said, hey, we'll refinance them all at like 2.6% when the rates were you know, way, way low. And he jumped all over, he said, absolutely, I can't get 2.6 anywhere. But, of the 10, uh, 10 apartments, two of them were in S-Corps prior to him coming. And he couldn't refinance those without, it, it would have basically it had been a relief of debt. What happened it was treated as a sale. See, he would have paid taxes because of the debt associated with it. So I told him, I said, you can't do it on the two S-Corps. Right? So he did it on the other eight and he left the two. So he missed an opportunity because they were in S-Corps. So you get into screwy situations with bases and relief of debt and, and because the debt had to be outside. So, it, 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 I, so don't put real estate, don't put real estate that you're gonna have rental for a long time in a C or an S. It's just bad, bad, bad. It's, it was bad. C Corps, you pay double tax. It's just stupid to do that. And uh, I, I, prior to 1986, it was okay. All right, 1986, they changed the law, and it was just no, no, no from there. And in 86, S Corps became very popular, and they still are popular. They're the, the most popular going forward. Um, but, they're, but, you know, there's work related. Any other questions? 
Choice of entity, yes. One, uh, can you switch uh, the entity in the middle of the year? Like All right, so let's, um, I'm a flipper or I'm a real estate agent and uh, got a bunch of them this year. And they start out, they don't know what they're gonna make, okay? So I said, be an LLC, okay? Be an LLC right from the get-go. You have to elect S Corp within the first 75 days of you becoming an LLC or the first 75 days of any tax year, okay? So I always say, hey, let's, you're already halfway through the year, you're not gonna make more than 50. Just be an LLC, single member LLC for the rest of this year, see how it goes. You really have until March 15th of next year to, to decide whether you wanna be an S Corp for 2020. Okay, so it gives you a little time to see. And I tell you, I can't tell how many people will know in February whether they're going to do it or not, okay? Whether they're, you know, they're going to keep their W-2 job or they're going all in and they're going to make more than 50. I, so I, I bet I had three or four that we made phone calls May or March 1st. Hey, which way are you going to go, okay? Are you going to, you going to make the election or not? And uh, three of the four, yeah. And, and so they're S Corps. So you kind of get like a mulligan that first year. You, you don't have to go in. And you don't have to go in the second year. It's, you can stay that LLC, but once you become an S Corp, you are an S Corp. You can't go back unless you make a revocation. And once you go back, you can't go back the other way for five years. So you can't be flipping back and forth, okay? But you always can start a new S Corp, which is what folks do. <laughs> so if you, if you revocate it and then, but it's, Usually if you're making more than 50, you're, you're gonna still make more than 50 every year. So you stay down that S Corp route. Okay. Yes? I apologize if it's not quite on topic, but if you have um, a holdings company, for example, like I'm trying to get all my income out of my social. So if you have multiple streams of revenue, it's like a, a business here, you have a flipping company, and then let's say you have like a, a revenue income from a hold. So like the hold is the LLC, the flipping company is S Corp LLC, and then the other business is like we'll say a corporation for example so all the income kind of crosses so, so like it all you got a holding company up top holding company up top yep. which is either llc or s corp but do you still get the same tax break benefit by you do on the s corp because if your s corp is one of the lower tiers you're going to pay salary and everything out of that entity <coughs> as a lower tier because it has employees because it has employees or you're going to be an employee because you have right. to pay yourself a reasonable salary but is it better to be an llc in the holdings or s corp given the fact that you're an employee of the holding company the whole, no, it's got to be partnership. I mean, the, the top, the top, it has to be an LLC. Correct. That's where you're yeah. getting paid. Yeah. From. Well, no, you're going to pay yourself out of your S corp. So I guess you have to, like, for example, like one of the businesses that we own is going to be buying a building mm -hmm. eventually. So the property, the, the income from the company is going to be purchasing the building, but the building is going to stay in the holdings or the the law, or excuse me, the real estate company, which is a, which is a uh, LLC. Right. Do these entities you owning them with somebody else? No. Okay. So, so I, I just kind of like to make it simple because what you've done, I mean, it's all flowing up, and yes, you've got one LLC. Um, and I'm okay with that. Uh, if you get any partners in those deals, it really mucks it up because now you got partnership returns going up to, to hold a company. But I, I always, I just, I just like having my separate because one member LLC, any one of those you just said it's gonna give you the same result. You just got, you got firewalls between every one of them as opposed to it all rolling up into the holding company. Because I, I would attack you and say, well, if you're bringing your profits up, up into the holding company uh, and one of those, uh, that holding company, I can get the money of the holding company. I can always sue, sue the holding company, I can sue the S Corp. Um, I, I, just, I just like separating them out. <coughs> That's my, me personally. But attorneys will tell you to, to roll them up. And I do have lots that, you know, they, they might have three single member LLCs all, well, I had a, um, uh, how should I say this? Prior to being able to marry same sex spouses, uh, you know, I, I had a couple clients that they owned it jointly, you know, same sex. And, and so that, uh, we had partnership returns, okay? And so, and that's a hassle with partnership. If you have 10 properties, you got 10 partnership returns to, to keep them separated. When they change the law so that they can file jointly, oh wow, we just, we just got rid of them all, okay? 
And now I have single members, and I said, look, you all pick and choose which ones you want, and we'll roll it up to a holding company. So now I don't even have all those partnership returns anymore, and you know, I do have the holding company as the only partnership return with all these properties rolling up into it. But none of them are an S-Corp. I keep my S-Corp separate. I don't want anything to mess them up. So uh, I keep them outside of the loop. Real estate all going up to different tiers is not a problem. You can do it with S-Corps. I'm just not a big fan of it because I, I like keeping it separate. Okay. Thank you. Oh. Anything else? We'll move on. All right. What should we go over next? Got any questions yet? We got it. lot of new laws last year. They all were effective 1118. Yay. The biggest thing is what the uh, talk about qualified business income. Okay. And you know, if I was president of the United States and I wanted to benefit anybody in real estate, which I have lots of, I would have drafted this law just as it is. It is a home run for real estate people. It is you know, I mean, our president couldn't have uh, drafted a better uh, law to benefit his properties and, and taxes. Um, and I'm not going to get political whether it's good or bad, but my point is it's a home run for real estate. Basically, the rule is any profit from whether it's anything to do with real estate, okay? The government's only going to tax you about 80% of it because you're going to get this what they call a qualified business income deduction of 20%. It's a home run. If you're making, there are, for 2019, if you're single and you make less than $160,700, you don't have to run through all these complicated hoops. If you're married for 2019 and make less than $321,400, you don't have to go through all these hoops. Between, if you're married, 321 and 421, the benefits start, can be phased out. After you get over 421, if you're in certain trades or businesses, not real estate, but certain trades or businesses, uh, you just gotta, you gotta jump through hoops, okay? And it's easy to jump through hoops with real estate. Um, because they allow you in this calculation to take your cost of your property and calculating uh, how to get through these hoops. It, it's, it's complicated, but what I want to leave you with, if you're making one, less than 160 or making less than 321, you should be getting this deduction. It's a deduction, what they call after adjusted gross income. It's before itemized deductions. Uh, just make sure if you got somebody doing your return or you're doing total tax, uh, just make sure you're getting it. it's 20%. So again, if you're making 100 grand uh, through real estate, you should get a $20,000 deduction that other people in other trades or businesses may not be getting. Those thresholds for self-employed people. Uh, uh, really, it doesn't. Uh, how should I say this? It, it, let's just say you're um, a woodworker making furniture, okay? You'll still get it uh, below the 321. But if you're over 421, it depends how much you pay in wages to your employees. It depends how much equipment and other assets you own. Uh, so I'm saying look at your, your whoever's doing it, whether you're doing it yourself, but look for the QBI because it's, it's just a home run. I mean, we got people saving just hundreds of thousands of dollars because of the QBI. And the rates are down. Uh, you know, our, our federal tax rates are down. Uh, I did projections at the end of 17. I put the 17 numbers into the 18 law, and I did it 250 times, and I had four people that would owe more in 18 than 17. That's how favorable the law is. And it was just weird situations where somebody was writing off $30,000 of employee business expenses in 17, which under the new law, you don't get. Uh, so, you know, obviously they, they didn't win. 
uh, but uh, it's huge. Plus, with the new law, you can write off so much stuff. Um, <coughs> you know, on a commercial building, we just had somebody put a $110,000 commercial uh, uh, built a roof. You have to write it off like that, okay? 17 would have taken 39 years to write it off. Under the new law, deduction, just like that. So it depends on what you're doing. Uh, other items, HVAC units, security systems, all that kind of stuff, uh, commercial buildings are direct, you can write them off immediately. Residential, 15-year uh, property, which are, say, fencing, parking lots, land improvements, those usually you get to write off over 15 years. Under the new law, they qualify for what they call uh, bonus depreciation, which means you get to write it all off, okay? Prior to, seven, prior to 18, if that parking lot, the parking lot had to be new in order to get 50%. Under the new law, it doesn't even have to be new. It could be one you purchase. It, it doesn't matter whether the, the item you bought is, has been used or it's new. Now, you can't buy from yourself from one entity to another and try to write it all off, but my point is even used property you can write off. Um, it's just a home run. I mean, you, the government is, uh, is open, open the door for deductions related to that. Ted, is that what cost segregation is? Or is that different? You want to talk about that? Or, I mean, I'm on a roll. All right, so. All right, all right cost segregation. Uh, one of the questions. It's going to cost you $5,000, $8,000, $10,000 if you're doing it on you know, a big apartment complex or a uh, commercial building. A good accountant is going to ask you to cost segregate what, when you buy a property. I mean, we do, you, you buy you know, a new um, you know, single family residential, what's in it? You know, is there a refrigerator in it? Is there a stove? Is there a washer dryer? You have carpeting in it, and we ask you to assign a value of what you think that's worth. You know, is the carpeting, oh, it's a thousand bucks, okay? Uh, you have light fixtures, you have uh, uh, window fixtures, you got blinds, you got stuff in there. Anything that's movable in that structure is what they call five-year property. And under this new rule, even if you buy a place, you get to write it off immediately because it's five-year property as long as, uh, well, not as long as, you just get to write it off because it's five-year property. To get to your question, the 15-year property, uh, like I said, you write off over 15, but you get, in 17, you got 50% bonus. Now you get 100% bonus. So I had a client this year, he bought a, um, a storage facility, you know, they, where you, pay the monthly fee, and, and he owns a lot of them. And I don't know what he paid, three, four million dollars for it. And he said, all right, you know, I'm not gonna get a cost seg on this. And it's one of the few times I said, I need you to do it. And he goes, why? I said, well, that parking lot is huge. Is that parking lot worth a million dollars? Is it worth $500,000? Is it worth 100,000? I said, I am not sticking my neck out to take a million dollar deduction on a parking lot because I have no clue, you know, I'm, I'm a dumb accountant. You gotta tell me what that parking lot's worth. He goes, can I tell you? I said, no, I said, no. It's worth spending, I think he spent 3,500, four grand to, to get that number. Because I'm taking a million dollar deduction on a return, I wanna be darn sure somebody else is on the hook for that valuation. For hotels and for, uh, and, and now even with Airbnbs, I, I'm getting a lot of those where, you know, the place is full of furniture. You know, it's, it's ready to go. And yes, every, all that furniture is a direct write-off. So you go out and you buy $300,000 property, you may have forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 of movable assets in there that is an immediate deduction. Would I do a cost save? Probably not because, you know, take pictures of what's in there. I mean, you got couches, you got a fridge, you got all that. Why would I pay five, $8,000 to do that uh, when, you know, it's a, a reasonable, uh, 
you're putting reasonable valuations on it. So again, the you can get them. The other um, storage facilities he had, uh, some of his partners required him to get cost saved on them. And you know, we see them and they are very aggressive. You know, they get into the wiring of the building. What's that wired to? Is it to a five-year asset? Then all the wiring related to that is 100% is write-off and you can get these really crazy uh, first-year deductions. Um, but as for him, I, I said, careful what you wish for. I mean, if you're getting allocated a million dollars of losses in the first year, are you gonna be able to use them all? You know, it, it's all timing. Uh, you know, if you buy a $5 million property, yeah, it might take you 39 years to write the $5 million off. <laughs> If you're front loaded, you know, yeah, you may get a million in year one, but you're going to get the other four, four million over, you know, 39 years. So by cost segregating, all you're doing is moving up those deductions in year one. And if you can use them, then it makes sense. If you can't use them, like I talked about it one, I said, why in the world would you do it on this one? I said, because you already had one in the same year. It's, it's, you're going to waste deductions. So he, he backed off and, and didn't cost seg the other one. And, we just use the, the, the land building assessments and park a little, park a little bit out for the parking lot. Uh, so there's cases where it uses it, but I tell you, there's a lot of people out there promoting themselves to do that. And uh, like I said, a good account's gonna do it. Um, especially, I mean, like a hotel. I mean, you know there's furniture in there. You know there's refrigerator, there's shelving. It, there's all the stuff that, I say, a sign of value. And uh, you, know, you can go with that value. That makes sense. Any questions on it? Um, what else would we talk about? Now, I said I just thought that Virginia had that. Virginia has not conformed with all the federal law, and a lot of states haven't. So when I just told you we wrote a million dollar park, parking lot off, well, Virginia says, uh uh, <laughs> you got to write that off over the 15 years. So you, you have. And I could, I, every state's different. Some states give you 75% of the million. Some of them are 30%. It's all over the board, state to state. And everything I'm saying here is federal law. So depending on what state you live in, the rules could be all different. Um, so you just gotta be aware of that. That yeah, you can save it for federal purposes, but you may not save it for state purposes. Unless anybody else has anything else? Uh, super quick yep. about the cost thing. Yep. The, uh, the deduction that you get, does it roll up to your personal stuff? Like, can you? Yes. I mean, yeah. I mean, if it's in an LLC, it's just going to come right on. A single member LLC is just right on your personal return. And partnership, it'll just split? Yes, okay. based on the partners. Okay. Do you have to be a real estate professional, though? That's one of these questions I can't share. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're talking about real estate professionals and, and tell you what, where people get in trouble with that. Okay. Uh, what's the best entity structure? All right, we did that. Um, how do you keep your limit, limited liability with entity structure but stop yourself from having to pay for multiple returns? Like I said, that if you do single member LLCs, then you don't have multiple returns. It's all flowing back on. Now, you, say, well, you know what? I gotta have a separate bank account for that single member LLC, and I gotta pay you know hundred dollar fee to the state. And I always say that's the cheapest insurance you'll ever buy. Uh, yeah, you get you gotta do that. Uh, and here's the reason why. Let's just say you do it and you don't set up the bank account, okay? And you run it all through your personal, and something bad happens, and you get sued, and you go into court and you say, hey. Judge, I'm a single member LLC. I'm protected. I have no worries. And if I'm the opposing attorney, I'm going to say, well, Judge, all those rents went into his personal account. He paid all his bills out of his personal account. Why should the court say he's an LLC when he didn't even treat himself as an LLC? And I'm going to win because you, if you're saying it's a separate entity, you got to act like it's a separate entity. Put your rents in there, pay your bills out there. The beauty of LLCs is you can put money in, you can take money out, it does, it's not a taxable transaction, you can do it all day long, but you want to treat yourself 
uh, or show you, you know, show the world that this is a separate life. This is a separate entity, so uh, so you can protect yourself. That's why you're doing it for liability exposure. So uh, do it. And yeah, I, we got people that got you know 30 LLCs, you know 30 bank accounts. It's yeah. So I, I have another question. Uh huh. Um, so like as we try to build business credit through all the businesses, mm -hmm. the, the our focus is to get everything out of our social to where everything is in our complete EIN and yeah. they can sell. Single member LLCs, you can get a separate ID number for it. No, absolutely, EIN yep. gives you separate etc. Uh, mm -hmm. My question is that most of our stuff is single member LLC because it is a sole proprietor owned. Mm -hmm. When I go, everything is through the EIN, so I do file two returns, one personal and one that, and I pay myself out of it. So my question is that from what you're saying is it's cheaper, just make sure I understand, it's cheaper from taxation and, and for preparing to go under your own entity, it's more expensive to file both because that's double the work. Um, but if it's a partnership return, you just have you know, another return that's it's just more work to that, that partnership return as opposed to, see on your personal return, all you're doing is putting the income and expenses yeah. and taking depreciation. On a partnership return, you've got to ask, oh, how many questions, probably 50 questions, you got to put a balance sheet on there, showing what assets you had. You got to show what money you put in or took out. You got to show what your your bank balance is, or not only your bank, but your uh, loan balances. Yes, yes. Okay. You just got it's just more stuff that we have to do and you have to do in order to do it. So it drives the cost up of preparing those, putting income and expenses all day long. I don't even have to ask you what your debt is. I don't. I don't. You know, all I need to know is what your interest was. As part of if I'm trying to separate it, does it make sense to file two or should I always still file it together? Like if I'm trying to separate it completely to where like if I want to sell the LLC at the end of the day, it no longer is attached to my social just my EIN. Well, it should be attached to your EIN. Correct. I guess right? But that EIN, for, for tax purposes, a single member LLC is a disregarded entity in IRS's eyes. Okay. All right, so it doesn't file a separate tax return. Okay, it just goes on to your return. Correct. But Eventually, we want to get away from that. Is my question. So, like, should we move them all to like a corporation or S corp? Like, eventually, I want it to be an entirely its own entity. Well, then you can have a partnership. You can put a, you know, your wife, your, you know, your mother, whoever is five percent owner, and now you have a partnership return, and everything would be filed in that partnership return. Okay. Um, but again, uh, you know, the single member LLC. Do not put real estate in an S corp, C corp. I'm gonna go back to that. Just, I keep them, keep them in that LLC because bad things can happen when they're definitely in a C corp. Okay. All right. Um, what's the best way to log your investment activity? <coughs> what's that? Mean? Your time or? Yeah. Like uh, to prove that you're a real estate professional, or how do you? All right, do all right. Let's start. There's one of those. In here. <clears throat> That's the next one. What is the basic deduction that real estate? Oh, do you want to do that one? What What are the basic deductions for real estate professionals? Okay. All right. Yes. <laughs> okay. So, to do to be a real estate professional for tax purposes, first there's a couple different distinctions. Uh, you got to be at least 750 hours in the business, doing, being a realtor, you know, landlord, whatever, in real estate activities. And that separates you from just somebody that just is an everyday investor or somebody that has one or two properties type thing, All right? When you're a real estate professional, then you get to deduct mileage, you get to deduct uh, fees for real estate, you know, all of the uh, dues that you guys pay, insurance, um, if you do any, marketing, that type of thing, any inter uh, meals. A lot of people, when they sell houses, you know, do uh, snacks, things like that. You know, all that kind of stuff you can do. Um, what you can't do anymore is entertainment. So I know one of the questions on here was, can you take your clients out to play golf? We're never going to talk golf again. Yes, yeah. you can, <laughs> but you can't deduct it. Where you can deduct it is if you are a company and you take all of your employees out to top golf. Then that's a little bit different story. If you are taking clients out to have fun, take them to a Tides game, ODU game, whatever the case may be. You can't do anything with that. But you can buy food at Top Call, which is it. Right. Only 50%, so keep, right? Right. Correct. So keep track of that if it's a significant amount. How about alcohol? <laughs> yep. <laughs> it's food. Yep. Oh, good. Okay. You got a drink, right? I mean, you get a little thirsty otherwise. <laughs> so, um, and then 
mean, as far as actually keeping track of how many hours you have, there's no hard and fast software or anything. You just let them know what, if the IRS comes in and says, let me see your log, you would say, okay, in a typical week I do go see these houses, I sell people, I, you know, whatever the case may be. I had a guy that does, uh, he owns like 28 trailer parks, something like that. And he had to go back and recreate his log for the last three years. And it turned into some giant spreadsheet. And the IRS agent said, okay, good. <laughs> so, um, you know, as long as you, it's, it's pretty clear that you actually do that and you can provide some sort of information, it should be okay. If you have one single family home and you're an accountant the rest of the time, it, it's not going to fly. Does that kind of answer what you're asking? Oh, absolutely. Okay. All right. So, you want me to keep going? Are they, they going to buy it if you're a full time military person? We have a lot of those. And you're trying to say that you're a professional. No. 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 The, the, all the court cases are doctors. And, and some of them are about, I mean, doctors might have 20 real, you know, properties out there. And they're saying they're a real estate professional, okay? And they lose every single time. Because they say, doctor, you're making 300,000. There's no way you're spending enough time to do these properties, okay? And they always lose. So the, the, the one thing, once you become a real estate professional, what that does is changes the character of your income <coughs> from non-passive, or, or I should say from passive to non-passive. And then if you're making less than, what is it now, uh, 250000 or something, uh, it really doesn't come, come into play. But once you start making more than that, now we have a 3.8% um, Obama net investment income tax on top of that. So if you're passive, okay, and you're making money, uh, you know, not only got to pay the income tax, now you got to pay this extra 3.8% on income over the 250, uh, just because it's passive. Whereas if you're a real estate professional, you don't, okay? As a real estate professional, you can also make an election to treat all your rental activities as one entity, right? You say, why, why does that matter? Well, the, seven, the 750 is per activity. So if you have 10 rental properties, all right, and six of them make money and four of them have losses, all right, and IRS agent comes in and says, uh, all right, uh, Mr. Yates, uh, uh, did you spend 750 on all these properties? And he's gonna say, yeah. And they're gonna say, you spent 750 hours on each of these properties? How, you can't do it, all right? But if you make the election to treat all these properties as one activity, you can say I spent 750 on all these activities. And why that makes a difference, and I see people get it all the time, not, not our client, you have to pay the taxes on the income, but if you're not a real estate professional, your losses are what they consider passive, all right? And you can't deduct those passive losses. So what happens is you get hit with all the income and none of the losses, and people get burned on that all day long. So it's, uh, it, you know, again, if you're flipping those hours, if you're, you know, commission income, you're gonna get there. Or the easier way, I, I got one now, only one, if you're married, only one spouse has to have the 750, okay? So I, I, mean, I got a doctor right now, and they got tons of rental properties, and it's, oh yeah, my wife does it all, okay? I make the money, and she's got all the real estate. Well, what that does is they're a real estate professional, even though the doctor doesn't do any, because the wife is doing it. So you only need one spouse to get you there, and once you're there, you don't fall into the 3.8 investment tax, and you get to offset all your losses and gains and everything. You get everything 100% full. Doesn't matter, you know, what your income is. Doesn't you, you, you just blow through all the, the limitations? That's why the real estate professional designation is is huge when you're in real estate because you don't want to have losses you can't use. All right. Any other questions? Keep going down the list. Questions on that part before we go on? All right. Another one that's on here several times off this list is self-directed IRAs in real estate. 
Short version is, we don't like it. Ah. <laughs> the reason is, there's several reasons that kind of go against it. Make sure he's not cringing over here when I say these things. <laughs> the whole point of doing real estate investing with rental properties is you get the depreciation. So the idea is the depreciation is throwing off losses and you're hopefully cash flowing from the property as you go. You can build up that way. If it's in an IRA, you're not getting the benefit of those losses. It's just sitting out there for you. Um, additionally, let's say you take some money out of your IRA and you buy a, a single family home, just to keep it simple. And all of a sudden you get to year three and you need to put a whole new roof on there. Well, you can only put 5,500 a year right now into an IRA. What if that roof costs 15,000? Where do you get the other money? You can't just put it in there. There's, there's limits every year in what you can and can't do. So it it's cause, can cause a problem with that. Additionally, one of the questions on here is the uh, UBIT tax. Basically, it's unrelated business income tax. If you have a self-directed IRA and you purchase a house, apartment building, whatever the case may be, and you finance it, that automatically makes that income subject to this extra tax, which is taxed at the corporate level. The IRA pays the tax, but it's you're not getting any benefit because now you're tr what you initially were trying to do is avoid paying any tax at all by putting it in the IRA. Well you're paying tax on that income, you haven't gotten any of that. Uh, the other thing is, is sometimes you know down the road you just want to cash out and take whatever money you've made on the property and then take it and use it for something else. Maybe you have kids down the road you want to pay for college, you know, whatever the case may be. You can't just pull that money out. It's in an IRA. It's kind of locked in there until you hit the 59 and a half. Uh, with Roth IRAs you can pull out what you put in, but again if all of your earnings are from the appreciation of the house and the sale, you're $50,000 in earnings, you can't pull that out. You might be able to pull out the 15 you put in over the years when you originally started. It doesn't really help you that much. So it kind of limits what your flexibility is. Uh, additionally, if you have something in an IRA house in an IRA and you pass away, you don't get the step up in basis uh, that you would otherwise get, uh, which could cause some people, I mean, nobody plans on passing away, but unfortunately it does happen. Uh, that's actually another question that y'all had on here is how does gifting real estate taxes work? I would <laughs> because essentially if when you gift somebody your house whatever property <coughs> you do, that person gets the carryover basis so say you bought it for a hundred bucks keep it simple okay and it's worth 200 now and I give it to my friend or my wife my kids whatever that case may be well that person now has a basis in that property of a hundred thousand dollars and eventually when they sell it for 200 whatever the case may be they're gonna have to pay the taxes Versus if you kept it in your name and then you passed away, as the law stands right now, your basis now in that property is automatically $200,000. And when your kids or your spouse or whoever the case may be sells it, there is no more gain. Mm -hmm. So you don't really benefit anything from giving it to your kids or your spouse. Giving it to a third party, I don't know, your grandpa or your grandkids, something like that, yeah, I probably still wouldn't do it you're losing a lot of those benefits and you're not really getting much of a gain. If you wanted to go, like you were talking about earlier with partnerships, you can do that. Uh, but again, it's also, it's a gift. Uh, it cuts into your annual exclusion. Right now, in your lifetime, you give $11 million worth of gifts. So more than likely most everybody in here is okay. Uh, don't take that the wrong way. I'm definitely okay. I'm not gonna hit that one anytime soon. Uh, but it, and it can always change. But, What's that? Change, change your mindset? Change your mindset. Yeah. I'll come to the next class too. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Maybe I'll get there one day. Um, but so, let me add on. one thing to David. The, on the IRA, traditional IRA, owning the real estate, you know, the beauty of real estate is you get these ordinary depreciation losses. And when you cash out, you get cap gains. But when it's in an IRA, you don't get the cap gains rate. You're gonna pull it out of the IRA eventually at ordinary income rates. So you lose the deductions coming in and you don't get the cap gains on the way out, which is why real estate is so attractive. So it, it's, people do it, we got clients that do it, but I, I tell them it, it's kind of the last place to look for money. Uh, you know, if, if you can finance it and do it yourselves, you're gonna be much better off tax-wise than having it in that. I, I just had this question from, guy, he made millions every year, and somebody told him, hey, you ought to do it, and he says, well, I'm gonna do it, and I go, why are you gonna do it? Because he's got 30 properties, and he, and he goes, uh, well, I heard, you know, I, I can do it, I can pay cash for it, I don't have to finance it, and I told him, I said, well, you're not gonna get any depreciation, 
and on the back side, you're not getting cap gains. He says, why would I do it? I said, <laughs> I'm not going to do it. I said, okay. <laughs> What about gifting it from one of your Solman Rail LC to another one of your Solman Rail LC? Not a problem. Carry over basis. And it's you own both sides. Yeah. So why would, to, to follow up with that question, why would you do it? Yeah, uh, for legal separation of the, of the property. Now the problem, that's okay. <laughs> the problem is S Corp to an LLC. Okay, now it's a taxable transaction. Right. Okay, and that's the mistake. There's another example of you set it up wrong, I tell you, you know, don't do the next one that way, and you go and you transfer it, and you've had it for 10 years, you bought it for 100, it's worth 200, and you transfer it to an LLC, that's a taxable event, you're gonna pay taxes on 100 grand, and you don't have any cash. So, real estate, stay away from courts. It's just, there's just bad things can happen. It doesn't have to happen, but it can. And like Ted said earlier, single member LLC is disregarded in so in the eyes of the, of the IRS, you own all those houses anyway for tax purposes. So it doesn't matter as far as transferring. LLC is a limited liability company. It's strictly for liability purposes, so you're fine. Yes, sir? As far as the IRS is concerned, um, what if you're doing like a much larger deal that is a equity, uh, SEC uh, passive investor uh, investment from the IRA? Like, like, a, say, like a REIT? No, say it's like, I don't know, like let's say we're buying like 1.5 million apartment and we have multiple investors that are putting up the entire capital gain, but let's just do the entire capital to purchase the property, but it's four IRAs totally equaling 1.5. So this guy puts up five, this guy puts up five, this guy puts up five. So you're all paying cash for They're it. all paying cash out of the second okay, that's good, and that's okay. But remember, with an IRA, whether it's Roth or traditional, <coughs> you, have a, you have to have a third party, party custodian. Yeah, of course, yeah. Okay, well, but if it's in a profit sharing plan or a 401k plan, you don't. Well, they're gonna move it to the self-directed IRA to purchase the property as an investment. But so you have to have that third party in place to, to hold that asset. Correct. Okay. The, the, the property still gonna depreciate for a tax event for a yes. tax advantage. Well, you're not gonna get it personally because it's it's all rolling back to your IRA. Absolutely, so yeah. I was making sure that, because we have some investors that we're talking to that are gonna roll into. Yeah. The ones that aren't in IRAs will get the benefits of that. So is everybody okay. in your example all gonna roll from your IRAs? No, so okay. we have, we have so one cash. To IRA and then third party right. so people in the IRAs get no benefit. They can still do it, and if they're if y'all aren't doing any other financing, like Ted said, it's all cash. You don't have to pay that UBI. UBTI. I got a call this morning. It's a, it's, there's three of them. Okay, two of them had it in their uh, 401k plans. And the other guy was an individual. Okay, and they're uh, I don't know. They're, they're the other two partners, not my guy. The other two are from overseas. All right, so they sold it. And they sold it on installment sale. So he goes, will you write the checks for us? I said, why? He says, well, I'm worried this guy's going back to his native country and I don't want to be waiting for checks from him. He says, I'd rather come here and you write the checks go all over the place. So yes, the two 401ks, there's no taxes involved because it's, he still has it in that 401k plan from the sales proceeds. But the third guy where they need a partnership return, he's going to pay taxes on it. Yeah, poor, yeah. yeah. And I thought it was in Carolina, but it's in Virginia. And so, um, and, and the, the third party was a Virginia resident, so there's no withholdings or anything because he's a Virginia resident. So, if I'm writing checks, I want to make sure I'm paying that Virginia, you know, if he was in Carolina, I have to remit the Carolina tax because they want him to file in Carolina. So, so yes, you can, you can bifurcate those entities, uh, but again, you, you've got to, he can't touch them, my guy can't touch the money, okay? Because even though it's coming into the partnership, I'm going to write it straight to his investment account, which is a 401k investment account. If he touches the money, he pays taxes on it, you know, unless you get into the rollover rule. So. That's what I'm going to make sure. Our, our percentage, which is not a 401k, which is just pure equity, we're going to pay all the taxes on the property from our particular portion of the LLC. That 401k will just get the benefit and then go on about their business. Right. Well, remember, the LLC, the tax burden is going to be split amongst the partners in proportion to their ownership. But so if, it's in, if, it's in a, if it's in a 401k IRA, then there's, it's tax, there's no tax on it. That's correct. Correct. So then it'll be split amongst, and I pay my percentage. And right. So if you own 10% of the thing, yeah. then yes, yeah, you're going to pay taxes on your 10%. Correct. Right. Okay. Yeah. We're still learning about it. We're trying to educate our investors and make sure they understand as well. Right. The nice thing with qualified plans is you don't need that third-party custodian. 
as long as your plan document allows for it to self-correct, you can do okay. it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Does that make sense? Yeah. I got more to learn, but yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. For the most part. I got a question about the um, step up basis. So if you pat you bought a apartment complex and you bought it for five million, you know, you've done some value add to it and it's you believe it's worth ten million. Who determines it's worth ten million? At that price, get an appraisal done. Yeah. When you pass away, get your executor to do an appraisal so that you have something to, to go back on. And that uh, step up basis or whatever is just your pro rata share, is what you're saying. If you that. pass away, right. you're, yeah, that oh, still applies, you your pro rata share. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. In that case, if you're in a partnership, what yeah. they'll do is they'll value the partnership interest just in case that partnership has several buildings or you know whatever it happens to be. And that's what you get the step up on. Yeah, we found the lenders require you to have a you know, single purpose entity for those LLCs to even get a loan on those properties. So, yeah, well, I've so. seen some of that too. When you get an appraisal, you want to tell the appraiser why you're going to get it. It's usually his first question because, you know, they got leeway there and, you know, if it's for estate purposes, nowadays they like to jack up that value. Uh, if you have a taxable estate, more than $11 million, they're going to want to depress that value as much as possible so you pay less estate tax. So, you know, it goes for gifting and everything else. I, I got people gifting, you know, dad's gifting part of his business down to the son. Well, those numbers are going to be very depressed because he doesn't want to use up his $11 million. So. You, you mentioned a second ago about installment sales. You're talking about seller financing. Mm -hmm. What is the advantage that you've seen for your seller doing that? Well, they don't pay taxes on, on right, the They haven't received the cash, right? Well, they don't receive the cash. I mean, it rolls in over time, and they self-finance it, and they get you know a nice interest rate as well. If we're not going too far off topic, if I'm if you were trying to buy a property from me, let's say an apartment complex, mm -hmm. and I had uh, I don't know, thirty in an apartment complex, mm -hmm. and you wanted to convince me to sell or finance, and you were a CPA, what would you say? Well, I, I would be telling you, hey, you don't have to pay the. Obviously, it depends on how much gain you have in it. They originally built it, so it's what right. they I mean, you it. got a huge gain in it. I mean, if we cash you out, you're going to pay a gigantic amount of tax over it, mm -hmm. and you're going to you know, have that net cash after uh, you pay your taxes. Where you sell or finance it, that cap gains, depending on your personal situation. If you're down in lower brackets, you don't even pay tax on cap gains if, if, you're, if your income is low enough. Uh, so, so what ends up happening is, you may be able to get a lot of it tax-free, plus, like I said, you can finance it and get a good interest rate on it. And you know, you may, depending on how credit-worthy the buyer is, get five, six, you be the bank. That's why I always say, you be the bank and get 6%. You can't go get 6% anywhere like that guaranteed. You got security on it, and if they don't pay, you just step right back in your own shoes and you still have the property. So you always like to get a good down payment so that you know they're, they're gonna keep on making those payments. So it truly is a huge tax saving. It is. So you're, you're, yeah. yeah, I mean, you're going to. Plus, once you get over six hundred thousand of, of taxable income, the capital gains rate goes from fifteen percent to twenty percent. So if you pop it all in the same year, a lot of that money is going to get taxed at twenty percent. You draw it out over how many ever years, you're going to probably stay down in that fifteen percent bracket, or you get to use that, you know, those lower brackets. So. Have to Does it pay on just the uh, interest portion of the payment? The interest year? you're always going to pay. The interest is ordinary income. You'll pay taxes on that interest, just like you would at a bank. Yeah. But the cap gains is based on the amount of principal you have received. Actually received. Yeah, yeah. Based on the gross profit of the sale. So um, yeah, it's be the bank. Uh, right, and if they don't, a lot of them don't have. My experience has been they don't have any great place they want to put it right now. That's we're correct. With the stock market. Why would you do it? So I asked them. I said, well, where, where are you yep. planning on putting the two million dollars? Oh, I hadn't thought about that. You know, something to look out for when you do installment sales. If you're on the seller side, any of the money that you receive, uh, whether it goes to pay off an old loan on the front, front building or commissions, you know, whatever it happens to be, that's still considered principal you've received. So you're going to still pay a portion of, of tax on that gain. So I've seen people run into problem is you know, the seller gives you a hundred thousand down, let's say, and then you finance the rest for them. So they take that hundred thousand that paid all the closing costs and you know so there's no cash left and then they get a tax return from us and it says well hey you owe you know you received a hundred thousand dollars you've got twenty thousand dollars in capital gain on that sorry you don't still have the cash but you need to kind of plan for it 
just keep an eye out for that because that kind of throws people off a lot of times. Even though it's the note. Correct. Because the note's your liability. Yeah, what you use that cash for is up to you. Okay. What is the and flipping? Like uh, if there's a buyer and you want to offer it? Ah, you, you can't do installment notes. No, I'm, I'm just saying like right now. It's, it's taxable immediately. You can't use installment notes when you're in a trader business. Okay? People, I, I had somebody flipping, uh, doing installment notes on mobile home, mobile home parks, right? And they said, well, we don't have to pay tax on this because we're, we're selling them all on time. I said, well, this is what you do for a living. You're in a trader business. You can't do that. And they go, well, we've been doing it for years and years. I said, well, I'm not going to do it. I said, if you want to do it, go back to your own. And they did. They went back to their own CPA to, to do it wrong. Uh, you can't do that. You're in trader business. You can't sell on installment agreements. It's taxable. You can do it. You can collect the note payment, but you're going to get taxed on the whole profit in year one. You haven't ever modeled that, have you, for anyone? Because it's so personal to what the seller's finances, taxes will be. You ever modeled? You know? Well, it depends on the gross profit of your sale. Yeah. But that's how you know you, you look like at it. But if you're buying a two million dollar thing and, and they originally built it, so their cost basis is you know I don't know five hundred thousand yeah. dollars. Well, then you got twenty years ago. Yeah, I mean, have you ever modeled it both ways to say they'd ha they'd owe this amount of taxes every time know, somebody calls it this time? Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, it's easy to figure out. It is, but okay. the, I, I tell you a little twist on it. I I like the interest rate. I mean, interest rates are low now, but I I, I mean I, I'll, I'll I mean I, I'll probably speak out of turn. There, there's a great place up in uh, uh, West Ocean View where it's a very popular bar. Well, I represented the guy who sold it to you know the people that own Ocean View, all right? And, and what happened was he was elderly, he was, he, you know, he wanted out, but he was so concerned that, that um, I think at the time we had like 8% note because rates were higher, okay? And it made sense for him as long as that note didn't get paid out. So I told him, I said, you know, I could tell you what's gonna happen they're going to sign this deal, they're going to do it, they're going to refinance immediately, and you're going to get all your money, and it's not the deal you want. So what I did was, I had them put it in there that they had a $50,000 prepayment penalty, okay? And yeah, if they want to give us $50,000 more to redo that, then we're, we're all in on that. And I can tell you, as rates went down, that guy was calling my guy all the time, yeah, we're going to do it. And I can tell you, the day after he died, his wife, Got a call. Hey, I'm gonna. I want to pay you off, and I, and I, I, she could hardly speak English. And I and I told her daughter. I said, do not do that. I mean, we did this for a reason. So that guy ran his whole term, got that eight percent on that, which left his wife and daughter in great shape. But uh, had you not had the prepayment, it would have been long gone, and they would be earning, you know, their one percent in the CD. So, so you can play with things like that, and you be the bank, you know. Uh, and with uncredit work, you know, people that aren't that great credit wise, you can charge an interest rate, you know, much higher. Well, I just use it because it, I tell my clothes on faster, you know, kind of go through the normal thing. Yeah, well, that's true. Um, yeah, process. Uh, you keep your investments in different states, states separated in different LLCs or you can put them together. And what are the pros and cons of doing that? Uh, somebody might ask, hey, you should have them in separate LLCs. Um, you have a state return. Wherever you have real estate, you would have a separate state return. Um, would I wrap them all up in one LLC? Absolutely not. We, we, we've been through that. Um, but you might have non you know, if you're living in Virginia now and you have them dribbled out all, all around all the Navy bases around the United States, you might have to file a California return. You might have to file uh, an Alabama return. So it's, it's no big deal because Remember, all we're talking about is federal law, okay? Uh, so that goes to all the states, but once I do a California return, I gotta follow a California law on that rental property. And, you know, like I said, all the states are different. You just gotta, just gotta keep up with it. Or, good thing our software keeps up with most of the depreciation. Yeah? So if you got a property in California, and they're gonna create an LLC for it, should you just leave it in California? I would. I tell you what, I, my answer to that is when a client asks, I always say, go to a California attorney and ask them, should you set it up in that state? I've had North Carolina attorneys tell me, no, don't worry about it, make it a Virginia. You know, it's just, 
I'm not an attorney. I, I want somebody else to answer that question because there may be favorable laws in that state versus Virginia or vice versa, and I don't, I don't know. Uh, but it's no big deal whether, you know, I, I can't tell you how many have paid lots of money for these courses and you were doing Alaska returns, you know, Delaware returns, uh, Nevada returns, all these other states. Uh, but you know what? I filed the zeros with them and if the real estate's in Virginia, I'm still filing, for, you know, the income's coming to Virginia. So it doesn't matter that you've set up in other states, it's, it's where the property is. Trying to entice private money partners to come into your deals. What is the simplest way to explain the tax benefits and investing in private money investors? Um, well, most private money investors, you're hoping just to get a loan, not as, as a separate partner. I, mean, I wouldn't give up ownership um, for somebody who's just going to loan you money. Um, I wouldn't. I, I want the whole deal. Partners are way overrated. Uh, and they only cause you problems. Uh, I've talked so many people out of partners, and they've all thanked me later on in life. Like, oh, what was I thinking? Uh, but if you're doing a deal, and it's really not a loan, but an investment into the partnership, now now I'm on board. I, I think you know if they're going to put up fifty thousand dollar down payment, and you're and you're going to do all the work, and you know you're splitting it fifty fifty. Yeah, I'm good with that because you wouldn't have got into that deal because you didn't have the money to begin with. So it just depends on the numbers. If 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 it's a if it's a loan, why have a partner? If it's truly a capital contribution into the LLC, then then it makes more sense. So don't I, I just had well, I, last week the guy said, well <coughs> I got the money, the other guy's got the wherewithal. He can put you know, tenants in this commercial building. And he said, I'm, we're gonna do a 50-50. And I was like, why in the world would you put $200,000 down, this guy's putting zero, and he said, well, he can get tenants in that building. I said, the guy's got no skin in the game. I said, you can't, I wouldn't give him 50% of that. I, said, I wouldn't do it. You're, you're taking all the risk, you're putting the 200 up. He's not credit worthy, you're signing on the note. You got everything to lose, he doesn't have anything to lose. So he's, he's changing that percentage. Um. <laughs> Hire a property manager. Right. Yeah, that's why I told him. I said, make a, pay him a commission to do it. You know, don't, don't give him the equity. Um, let's see. Uh, we talked about self-directed. Self-directed IRAs. Uh, for tax purposes, an ideal time to exit a property. Uh, and so, for example, now, I, the fact that your depreciation has run, which means it's, you know, in the old days, in the early 80s, you could write off real estate in 15 years, and it was 18, 19, we're up to 27, commercial 39. No, if the thing's a good thing and you're getting a good return on it, keep it. Uh, uh, you know, and if you don't need the money or anything, you die with it and your kids can, uh, or your spouse can depreciate it all over again. Uh, I, I had a lady uh, back in 84, her husband owned, he owned like 20 rentals around here, and he died. I did his estate return back in 84. And daggone it, she didn't live into her 90s, and I took those properties and redepreciated them all over again. Uh, home run for tax purposes. Uh, and, um, you know, she paid so much less because we wrote all those buildings off. So, how, how does that work then? I mean, it, you get a step up. Yeah, but so if they did they own them jointly? No, right? There was an old rule, all right, and it really I, I ask it every now and then. They had bought these properties prior to nineteen seventy and, and there was an old court case that I hang my hat on <laughs> that back in the old days in the fifties, sixties, who put the money into these rental properties? It's usually the husband. He was the only one working. Right. All right. So the, the wives really didn't have any skin in the game. And so, like I said, this old court case assumed for properties prior to 1970 that the man had put all the money in and it was owned 100% by the man, even though it was joint in the And so I did a lot of those back then. And so if the man dies first, boom, I got a full step up. The man, you know, even today, it, it doesn't matter who puts the consideration in, right now, it's treated as 50-50 between husband and wife. So you get a half step up no matter who put the money in for husband and wife. 
It does matter if it is not husband and wife. So if you're if you put your kid on a 50% partner and they didn't put anything into the deal, you're treated as all yours because they didn't put anything into the deal. So it just depends, but um, but the step up, you know, there's not too many great things like that. Roth IRAs, you never pay taxes on it. Step up, hey, you get write it off all over again. It doesn't get any better. <laughs> Let's see, what's the next one? Uh, depreciation. Professional, can I write that off? I hear IRAs, they are. Should I, what should I have? S Corp LLC, yeah, what tools? Um, how does it get gifting real estate? And we purchase real estate. For, real estate, that answer David said has changed over the years about kids owning real estate. And the reason is there used to be some very aggressive strategies. Um, where we could specially allocate depreciation. So uh, my partner, that's really his claim to fame, is back in the 80s, what you would do is have a family partnership, okay? And why, why it's called a family partnership is all family members. So say you have a husband and wife and three kids, okay? So, and the thing was making money. Well, you would give the kids an ownership interest but you would allocate all the depreciation to the general partners, which were mom and dad. So for tax purposes, what ended up happening is mom and dad's K-1 showed a loss, all the kids showed income. I mean, how great, and we didn't have the kitty tax back then. So we were pumping income to these kids all day long and taking losses on the K-1s for the parents. Sorry, it's just like a timer. IRS got kind of wise to that in um, the 80s. And they said, you can keep doing that, but we're not gonna respect this for estate tax purposes. And what that means is it's, it wasn't a completed gift. So if mom and dad died, uh, they'd have to bring the, uh, the, the value of the kids' interest back into their estate. And, and that was an issue because back then the exclusion was only 600,000 from estate taxes. And then they raised it to a million. And you know, what, about five, seven years ago, it was two and a half, it was three, it was five. And then it was supposed to expire and, and go back down to one. But Congress, who wasn't getting along, both sides, not playing politics, they couldn't agree on anything. But then like in the, the wee hours, they, they all got in the same room and said, Let's do everything each everybody wants. So the Republicans wanted it up, and that's exactly what happened. It jumped up from five million to ten million, now to eleven, and it's indexed for inflation. So it's it's eleven million plus. And if your wife's living, it's another eleven million. And if you die first, you used to have to do all this estate planning to get trust and stuff to keep the eleven million. Don't have to do that anymore. So the mom can die, and everything joint rolls to the dad. Dad dies, that's a bad example, I always go the other way. Dad always dies first. Goes, goes to the mom. <laughs> mom has $22 million. There's no estate tax. This is, this is home run. That's so, right. and then you can step up the values as, as much as you can. Um, and um, like I said, re-depreciate it all over again. So I gave you the young person rule. Those are the old guy rules. Yeah, those are the old guy rules. Um, None of that probably applies to this person. Well, <laughs> yeah. but, but like I said, we still actually do some, y'all don't do, but we actually still do some partnerships, especially allocating that depreciation to uh, the kids, because kids now are in their 40s and you know, it doesn't work as well. But the kitty tax kind of took that away, because now you make more than $2,000 on a kid's returns, they're paying at the upper rates, which you didn't have to do back in the 80s. So it's, it's not, you know, we're, we're I don't recommend it anymore because the rates are so high after two thousand dollars of income. So basically, buy real estate in the eighties. <laughs> Fifteen years. Exactly. I tell. All right. Prior to eighty-six. Fifteen years. I mean, any building, whether commercial, your resident, people, all anybody who had money was buying real estate. There was no passive loss rules. All right. So you, and they had what they call investment tax credit on property. So. I went in buildings and you know the rafter here, if it's screwed in, 
I got 10% of this as a tax credit. If it was nailed in, I didn't get it. All right, I could go almost every component in here, and people were building buildings because they got a 10% tax credit immediately, and the rest got written off over 15 years. Like uh, North Shipco Dry Dock, okay? There's a big dry dock right across from Waterside, massive big boats in there. That thing is not uh, bolted down to the, the uh, seabed right there. It is a floating dry dock. They got an investment tax credit on it. It was like $700,000 of investment tax because it wasn't bolted down into the water. It's a floating dry dock. I, the, well, I, I just can go on and on. What, it, was, it was stupid. People were buying real estate not for the investment or the economic reasons. It was for the taxes. In 1986, that's when they stopped it. It was the most comprehensive tax law, even more than last year's. Everybody said last year's. So what that basically meant is if you made more than 150000 you couldn't write off your real estate losses with passive losses, okay? They haven't even indexed that. I mean, this is 1986, and now we're 2000, whatever, 20? That's what, 20, 30, 34 years later, we're still using the same, it phases out between 100 and $150,000. So they did with that, then they started ramping up the depreciation, you know, it went to 17, 18, 19, and now commercial property is 39 years. Uh, but now we've got in the last couple of, well, in, in 18, 19, we're swinging back the other way where we're able to write off stuff that we haven't been able to write off. So they're making it more attractive than ever. Um, but that's, that's the reason these rules came in. Because the government said, look, you, people are doing this for tax reasons, not... Just as a, as a dodge. Right. Um, and you go back and you take a tax book and you look at the rates in 19, <coughs> 1981, okay? 19, I got them behind my bed, right behind me. 1981, if you made $100,000, your next dollar was taxed at 70%. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, people are screaming now at 35%, 37%. If you're married, the next dollar, it was double, the next dollar for 200000 was taxed at 70%. So you're yeah. telling me I can go out and buy real estate and take 10% now and write this thing off 50 and I'm saving 70 cents on the dollar? Yeah, that's what everybody was doing. Well, people getting married just to bump up their... Go from 100 to 200. People do crazy things. Yeah, uh, sure. Ask me every year, I ask them, did y'all get married? And they, every year they say, should we? And I, with these last laws, I said, yeah, I mean, if you like that, you probably should. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't heard this year. We have a lot of clients get married in islands, so they're not married for tax purposes, or they might for the islands, and they make me swear that I don't tell anybody because because their parents don't even know, or vice versa. You know, it's just, you know, but people do it for tax reasons, not for... Um, yeah. Very interesting. Uh, All right, I know we got off base there. So, um, are we good? Where, where are we at? We got, there's six more minutes uh, to eight o'clock. You guys can probably. Six, six more minutes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's pretty good. I got you. Yeah, that's time. Yeah. What's the benefits to moving real estate to a trust or anything related yes. to a trust? I, I got asked this last year. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good question. Trusts are not, a lot of attorneys like them, okay? First of all, attorneys like them, and I'm going to beat up on attorneys. Attorneys like them because they usually put themselves as a trustee and they get a fee out of it, okay? And they got to pay them to set it up. Yes, and you pay them to set it up. Inherently, they're not bad, okay? And if you know what you're doing, they're just like a single member LLC, okay? Because usually they're disregarded. But kind of like... Uh, my analogy. Things can go wrong with it. Okay? If you die and you have somebody in there, a sister, or whoever, they can get caught because the trust rates are the maximum rates, which right now is 37% on like more than $12,000 of income. So if you don't know what you're doing and you don't make distributions properly or timely, you can get caught paying stupid taxes. So I'm not a fan of them unless unless it's really somebody knowledgeable that knows what they're doing, okay? Um, I, I don't know how to say it. It, it. They're not bad, I like them, but what I, I wouldn't do them because, you know, if my sister was involved, I, there's no way she would know what to do, you know? And, and now you gotta go see another professional and pay another fee and, I, so, they can work if everybody's on the same page. Um, 
three minutes? Good, good. Okay. How do you get the All right. Do you think we want to? All right. So we'll, we'll ask the question. We'll have a game. Okay. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> so get your little books out. The person who tells me that the value of the Generation 1 Apple One computer, what it retailed for, and the page number gets the Lowe's gift card and the books. You guys, we don't have books. We don't have books. Oh, okay. So they might get the books. Someone got the books. Who doesn't have them? Lowe's books. That's our page number, sir. I didn't get the questions either. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Get the nine? I got the nine. So okay. I got the questions now. So everybody in this room didn't get them. It was help. Ted's up here and he's talking about uh, laws that he used fr from the 80s to basically save his clients tons of cash. Um, and, you know, that for me, it's crazy that you can index all of that stuff and reference that on, on a talk here. So we appreciate you guys so much. Uh, you guys going to stick around for a little bit to have conversations? I'm assuming? Yes, in now. <laughs> <laughs> Just kind of you guys out there. Um, guys, thank you so much for coming. Next, uh, next month's meetup is getting planned right now. We'll be announcing that here shortly. The, uh, this entire talk is going to be uh, put up on YouTube and we're also going to uh, send out the link for that YouTube in an email. So if you haven't already filled out your, uh, filled out the uh, sign-in sheet, put your information on that sign-in sheet, go ahead and do so now. Uh, thank you so much for coming out. Merry Christmas to you guys from the Think Real Estate team. Woo! Say your goodbyes to Melanie before she leaves. Give her your hugs and uh, we'll see you next month.